Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Greek Community of Melbourne's public seminar series. And as, as always, a special welcome to those who are joining us for the first time and participating in the series. Um, I would also like to mention that those who have registered and are following us through Zoom, just before the end of the seminar, I will be putting out a request for questions. So feel free to use the chat function um, to submit any questions that you may have uh, for the speaker. Also, just letting you know that this year the seminar series has been uh, extended because we had a delay at the start. We'll be running until the end of November. So please go to our website and have a look at what other seminars are in the pipeline until the end of the year. Uh, also, those on our mailing list will be getting those weekly updates uh, as well. And just a reminder that next week's seminar, we have... Dr. Violeta Hionidou will be speaking on famine and death in um, occupied Greece during World War II. So hope to see you at that seminar as well. Same, same time, Thursday, 7 p.m. Now let's move to tonight's topic. From uh, Phasis to the Pillars of Heracles, like frogs around a pond, ancient Greek overseas colonization and the identity debate by Dr. Lever Donnellan. Well, the title is deliberate to highlight the extent of Greek colonization in antiquity, basically all over the known Mediterranean world. 
From the Pillars of Heracles, today's Straits of Gibraltar to the Black Sea port of Farsis in present day Georgia. But before we launch into this topic, let me say a few words about our speaker, who in some ways can be described as a COVID refugee. Uh, in modern times, we can have climate change refugees. Why can't we have COVID refugees as developments are unfolding? Firstly, I'd like to congratulate uh, Leva on behalf of the Greek community of Melbourne, as she's the newly appointed lecturer in classics and archaeology uh, uh, at the University of Melbourne. Um, although this appointment has been made some time ago, uh, Leva remains stranded in the Montenegrin seaside town of Tivat, still waiting for a visa and work permit to come through. But I'm sure she'll eventually reach our shores and she'll eventually meet her students in the flesh. They're just not avatars, they are real human beings. So, um, Liga Donnellan is a graduate from Ghent University, then being the largest city in the Flemish region of Belgium. Uh, she then pursued um, research at the University of Chicago, Contingent in Amsterdam. Um, and before joining the University of Melbourne uh, as a lecturer, uh, she taught at Aarhus University in Denmark. Her research focus, focuses on early Greek colonization and urban architecture in mainland Greece and, has, and currently has been conducting field work in Calumbria and Viotia in central Greece. Most recently, she edited the volume Archaeological Networks and Social Interaction, a work spearheading new, new digital methods in archaeology. Um, research into Greek overseas colonization antiquity has been studied for centuries now. However, it'd be unrealistic or highly improbable to expect spectacular discoveries from big digs. These massive finds appear to be mere ex exhaustion. However, this doesn't mean that we can't shed new lights on the phenomenon of, rapid, of the rapid spreading of Greek settlement and migration from the 8th to the 16th, 6th century BC. Microscale analysis of patterns of deposition of artifacts aims at reconstructing past practices and daily life. Chemical and microscopic analysis allows us to establish the origins of pottery and thus make, makes it possible to establish routes of trade and exchange of populations at the time. Through those, these methods and others, the narrative of ancient Greek colonization not only continues to be written and questioned, but also challenges us to re-examine not just the ancient Greek past, but also scholarly treatments of this past. A speaker tonight will touch upon the, the use of these new methods and introduce a number of recent questions uh, and challenges. Uh, Lina, congratulations once again. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Nick, for your uh, warm welcome and your lengthy introduction. Uh, so good evening, everyone. I'm um, going to put up a PowerPoint I have brought for you. Can you see the PowerPoint? Okay, I hope you can uh, see the PowerPoint. So indeed, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm excited, very excited to be with you tonight uh, from Europe, even though it's uh, just in a virtual role for now. I'm sure that eventually I will get there uh, also physically. So as Nick said, the topic of my talk is the so-called ancient Greek colonization, and then particularly the identity debate that stems from it. And I would like to start by looking at this quote taken from Plato's Phaedo, from the faces to the pillars of Heracles like frogs around the pond. Now, Nick already gave a very nice introduction and spilling the beans on what actually this quote uh, means. So the faces is a river uh, at the far end of the Black Sea in Georgia. And the pillars of Heracles uh, is the name that was given in antiquity to the street of Gibraltar. So the very end of the Mediterranean at the entrance into the Atlantic. 
And this quote is uh, often used by modern scholars to indicate the enormous extent of the ancient world and then specifically the ancient Greek world. And I think one of the, of the most uh, famous users can be found in this now classic study of Mediterranean history published in 2000 by Peregrine Horden and Nicholas Purcell. But actually the quote figures in many other publications uh, as well. So what is this about? So on the map, you can see uh, the extent that the Greek world had reached in the fifth century BCE. So it's basically uh, depicted in pink. I hope you can see my arrow moving on the screen. So we see basically the Greek world extending almost all around the Black Sea into Asia Minor, even present day Libya uh, on the North African coast, Sicily, the south of Italy, the south of Spain, and here uh, into uh, the side of France and here into Spain, uh, almost reaching the pillars of Heracles. Now, this was an achievement that was realized as the Greeks themselves believed in Plato's days by the foundation of cities overseas. And the Greeks thought that this started somewhere several generations after the Trojan War. Now, scholars today start the date of this uh, uh, Greek colonization somewhere in the early 8th century BCE, at least for the first explorations, after which it supposedly rapidly accelerated in the late 8th, early 7th century BCE. And little would Plato know that not even a century later, Alexander the Great would move much further east and phases, which you actually see here, uh, on the slide. So Alexander the Great would move much further east and extend an empire basically into India. And in due course, he would found several more Greek cities, uh, mostly named after himself and one even named after his horse. However, um, scholars do not usually consider these uh, foundation of cities in a Hellenistic time as part of the phenomenon that we call Greek colonization. So scholars actually see this phenomenon of Greek colonization uh, finished in the fifth century when the colonization was supposedly overtaken by Athenian imperialism and more hostile foundation activities. So col colonization, the phenomenon we are talking about here tonight is essentially something from the archaic period. Now, scholars have started to study this remarkable extent of the Greek world beyond the Aegean proper as early as the 16th century. And one of the first uh, people to do so is uh, someone you see depicted on the slide, and it's a Sicilian monk, a Dominican monk called Tommaso Fazzello, or Fazellus as he liked to call him, who wrote uh, a history, one of the first histories of Sicily. And in doing so, he collected fragments also from ancient sources. And he drew uh, a lot on uh, Thucydides and other sources because actually we have a lot of written information about the Greek cities uh, of, of Italy. So actually this field of um, Greek cities, overseas foundations became a valid field of study in itself. And actually the topic of Greek colonization became of great interest to scholars uh, and even governments. And for example, in 1745, the French Academy, the Royal Academy of Inscriptions and Literature issued a prize uh, asking scholars to write essays about the question, quels étaient les droits des métropoles grecques sur les colonies, sur leurs colonies? What were the rights of the Greek metropolis over their colonies? Les devoirs des colonies envers les métropoles, what were the duties of the colonies towards the mother cities? And les engagements réciproques des unes et des autres, and what were their mutual relations? Now, this uh, prize question, um, the essay, the winning essay, was written by someone uh, called Jean Pierre de Bougainville, whose portrait you see uh, on the slide. 
Um, and he wrote actually a remarkable work that by today's standards is uh, actually fairly complete in his collection of ancient sources about Greek colonization. And it's even fairly nuanced uh, in its reading of uh, what actually happens in the uh, so-called uh, Greek colonization overseas. Now, actually, colonization, interesting colonization, ran in the Bougainville family because um, Jean Pierre was the brother of the man uh, whose portrait you see on the slide. Um, and he was Louis Antoine. He was a French admiral who realized the first French circumnavigation around the globe. And uh, he wrote an extensive memoir about this. And uh, so we know that he actually must have narrowly missed the Great Barrier Reef uh, even. Uh, so who knows what would have happened if he actually touched upon it. We might be talking to each other in French now rather than in English. However, this topic of Greek colonization continued to be of great interest to scholars. So we see in the 19th century, ever more studies being published. And you see two examples on the slide. Uh, there's, for example, a um, Raoul Rochette, who wrote uh, Histoire critique de l'établissement des colonies grecques. So it's a critical history of the foundation of Greek colonies. And there's uh, Mr. Gustavus Diesterweg, who wrote uh, the Jure Coloniarum Grecarum, so actually a legal history about uh, the Greek colonization. So basically, what were all these people looking at? What were they talking about? And one of our main sources for um, Greek colonization, um, no doubt, is Thucydides. So the fifth century uh, historian Thucydides wrote a book, as I imagine most of you know, about the Peloponnesian War. And in the uh, sixth part of his book, his sixth book, he provides an extensive introduction uh, to fighting that's going to happen in his story in Sicily. And so he starts in his book by explaining what, uh, what people used to live on, on, on Sicily. And we learn from that that there were monsters living on Sicily first, and Cyclops, and then Phoenicians. Uh, and then he says, uh, came the Hellens. And he explains to us that of the Hellens, the first to arrive were Chalcidians from Euboea with Thucles, their founder. So they founded Naxos and built the altar to Apollo Archegetes, which now stands outside the town and upon which the deputies for the games sacrificed before sailing from Sicily. So very interesting. We learn who came from where, what city they founded and what happened. So Thucydides goes on to explain that Syracuse was founded the year afterwards by Archias. And here he explains that this is someone from Corinth, one of the dynasty of the Heraclids. Uh, and he started waging war on the Sickles, who was one of the native populations of the island. So, and then uh, Thucydides provides us with information about the city, how it expanded, how it uh, flourished, and how it became popular. So, and then uh, the story goes back to Thucles and the Chalcidians, who apparently, um, Thucydides explains, set out from Naxos, specifically in the fifth year after the foundation of Syracuse. And they also started fight fighting these native tribes um, and founded uh, in due course two cities, Leontini and afterwards Catane. The Catanians, however, they choose for themselves another founder, uh, a certain Evarchos. Now, and then Thucydides goes on uh, with a story about a certain Lamis who arrived in Sicily with a colony from Megara. And uh, well, they have uh, several episodes. They move and move and move and move again. And then eventually they get uh, a place to found a city from a native king, Hublon, uh, the sickle king, who granted them the place to found their city, Megara Hiblaya. 
Now, in his book, uh, Thucydides goes on and on and on, uh, and he provides us uh, with a fairly good uh, background to what the Greeks at least thought was the process of foundation of cities uh, in Sicily. And lo and behold, archaeologists have actually been able to verify a lot of this information about the overseas cities on the ground. So where Thucydides describes that there were cities, in most instances, archaeologists have actually found remains of Greek cities. Now, and some cities never cease to exist in Sicily. For example, on the East Coast, we have Syracuse, uh, still a magnificent city, uh, continued all through the medieval period uh, up until the modern day. And the same goes for Catane, uh, Messina has always been, ever sin since antiquity, a very important city here on the streets and controlling the um, vessels that enter into, uh, into the Tyrrhenian Sea. Now, other sources, uh, for example, Herodotus, um, also provide us with information about the Greek overseas cities. And in Herodotus' case, this actually allows us to literally trace the Greek world from the faces to the pillars of Heracles. Now, sadly, no complete ancient history of overseas cities has been preserved. So we are basically bound to work with uh, fragments, short stories, basically footnotes to other histories uh, that give us some kind of small detail about the background of the foundation of Greek cities, who came from where, uh, what the situation might have been upon the foundation of the city. Now, in the 19th and especially the 20th century, our knowledge about these Greek overseas cities has vastly increased because archaeologists started big digs, large scale excavations in which they literally moved tons of sand and stone to uncover entire cities, to uncover temples, uh, to uncover theaters, uh, and so on. So, a lot of scholarly effort has been placed in collecting uh, and putting together all these written sources and archaeological material uh, to provide us with a picture as complete as possible about the history and the material culture of the colonies. And uh, most notable are um, the pile of books you see depicted on the slide, which are uh, 20 plus or so volumes of the uh, series, the Bibliografia Topografica della Colonizzazione Greca in Italia Meridionale e le Isole Tirreniche, the Italians love lengthy titles uh, for their books. Um, and another very important volume, which is uh, a complete inventory of all known polis of archaic and classical times, which was compiled by a group of researchers in, uh, at the University of Copenhagen who had a research center that unfortunately does not exist anymore, but they put together this massive catalog of cities from all over the Greek world, from the Black Sea, from Spain, from France, uh, and so on. So that um, gives us a very good idea about the cities we have, the monuments uh, that are there, the coinage they issued, and so on. Now, we can say we have a fairly complete picture of the Greek overseas cities. Uh, and there are, however, several open questions. Now, you will think you have been studying this for almost 500 years and you still haven't figured it out, no. We actually keep asking new questions. So, and this is actually what I want to talk to you about today. Some of these new questions and new debates that have come up about this uh, Greek colonization. And a part of our new questions stem from contemporary debates in our society. And I also believe it is our 
duty as scholars to engage in these debates. Now, the so-called post-colonial theories have been used to study Greek colonization for several decades uh, by now. And some of the outcomes of this debate, as I will also address later, is that the word colony might not be appropriate to describe the ancient reality. Now, another topic that has come up in these uh, post-colonial debates is that uh, actually colonization, colonialism is not a good analogy to describe the ancient situation. However, I must say that given the recent developments, and especially in the United States, uh, of course, but also elsewhere, um, also in my own um, home country, Belgium, there's a renewed call for scrutiny of our colonial past. And I, I think we have to turn to the question in the near future of how in the 18th and 19th century, ideas about the past were used to legitimize colonialism and imperialism. And we all know this was the case. And I think our field has a role to play here. And I think, I hope that in the uh, coming years, we will see studies appear addressing uh, these questions exactly. So what is the issue with Greek colonization? Well, as I, as I just said, the word colony um, is considered to be rather inappropriate. Actually, colony comes from Latin, whereas the Greeks used the word apoikia, home away from home, literally. Um, Whereas colony, the Latin colony, invokes the kind of conquests and foundations that the Romans would implement centuries later. Uh, and this invokes a whole different kind of dynamic than what we consider to have taken place in Greek antiquity. So, and as a, as a result of the use of this word colony, uh, there's also, um, as some scholars have pointed out, uh, false analogies that have been drawn between ancient Greek overseas foundations and modern colonialism. Because uh, we must understand that the archaic Greek polis did not possess the infrastructural power that the empires of modern days would have had, that the Spanish, uh, Brits, the French would have had. Um, in modern times, for example, uh, the colonizing powers possessed weapons, possessed technologies that were uh, far, I wouldn't say superior, but more destructive uh, in terms of encounter with native populations, whereas the Greeks in ancient times did not differ uh, much in technological terms from the people they would have encountered overseas. So that created a very different kind of dynamic uh, in the interaction between uh, the groups. Now, another problem that has come up as a result of these big digs is that actually the picture that is uh, written in, in the sources by Thucydides and Herodotus does not quite agree with the archaeological reality. And most notably, the metropolis that uh, Thucydides so enthusiastically mentions in his History of Foundations uh, are not exactly attested on the ground. So we don't find the traces that we would expect from the mother city. Uh, and actually, we find quite a lot of evidence of native populations. Um, which, uh, well, as we would believe, uh, reading to see this would have would have been uh, destroyed or at least sent away in war. Uh, now, and one of the things that has been pointed out in these post colonial debates is that the indigenous populations in the ancient Greek world, so the people with whom the Greeks came in contact have been largely overlooked. And this is, of course, something we have to address. Now, 
Another problem, and this is not specific to the study of uh, the so-called Greek colonization, is that uh, classical archaeologists for a very long time have been mostly interested in the beautiful painted pots and temples rather than that they desire to write an objective uh, social or economic history. Uh, and this has created a very distorted picture of the ancient Greek world and of ancient Greek culture. Now, the second problem, so that was the problem with colonization. Now, the second problem uh, in the study here is our definition with Greek or Greekness. And I want to illustrate this by looking at this beautiful vessel. So this is a beautiful vessel uh, that we can talk about, look at, um, which was recently sold at Christie's for a lot of money, $25,000, if I remember correctly. So it is an, an amphorae, uh, a uh, red figured amphorae that comes from Apulia, which is uh, basically the very south of it, Italy. And if you imagine Italy as a boot, uh, Apulia would be the heel of the boot uh, of Italy. So the vessel is attributed to a specific painter who was active uh, at the end of the fourth century BCE. Now, the amphora shape um, was actually not specific to the ancient Greeks. Many of the other populations around the Mediterranean used amphorae. So can we really call this shape Greek? It's a problem. Um, if we look at the decoration now, this seems clearly related to the kind of uh, technologies that we know from Athens, that we know from the Greek world. So, okay, in terms of decoration, we could say that this is a Greek vessel. However, if we start looking in more detail at uh, the scene that is depicted, uh, well, we see uh, a man seated and two men standing clad in armor uh, saying goodbye. And this is a quite conventional um, funerary scene uh, in which um, people say their goodbyes. And the vase probably comes uh, from a tomb. We don't have an exact uh, context from it, but intact faces usually come from tombs. Now, uh, first sight, uh, this looks fairly, fairly okay, fairly Greek, fairly known. However, if we dig deeper here into the context, in the Apulian context of the fourth century, this is actually a time and a period and a region where, uh, at least according to ancient sources, the Greek cities were conquered by native populations. And archeologically, this is attested in the first place through armor and a change in scenes that are depicted that emphasize more uh, the role of the warrior. So actually what we see depicted on the scene here on the face is, is uh, a series of values that relate more to non-Greek cultural backgrounds than that it relates to Greek backgrounds. So this illustrates our problem uh, and the kind of complexities we are dealing with when we are talking about Greek colonies, Greek culture, Greek overseas um, remains. Now, one of the um, suggestions that a scholar has made recently is that we should move at looking uh, at what is called the so-called third Greece. So uh, scholars for a long time have looked in the first place at the Greek world from uh, uh, center to periphery kind of approach. So uh, Athens and Sparta being the first and the second Greece, and actually everything that was outside of this classical highlight being very much ignored uh, and very much, um, let's say, considered a periphery rather than studied uh, in its own um, in its own purpose. Now, it has been suggested that we should move towards looking more at this third Greece and look at the actual dynamics that existed in the ancient world. Now, one of the reasons that 
Athens and Sparta are so much studied is, of course, because we have a wealth of written information, we have a wealth of inscriptions, especially from Athens. So that some sort of explains why we know much less about other regions of the Greek world. So how could we possibly proceed with studying this so-called Third Greece? Now, one of the solutions is, of course, to emphasize archaeology rather than uh, external written views that come often from Athens or uh, from, from other periods or regions than the one that might be, uh, be studied. Another solution is to include all the material remains in the studies and not just the beautiful pots and the temples or the golden jewelry. We can also apply scientific methods like um, chemical analysis, microscopic analysis of the composition of material, which will give us an indication of the origin of material. We also possess tools to do remote sensing, so to study settlement patterns without actually excavating them. Now, the downside of these new methods is that they are very expensive. So unfortunately, we don't apply them as much as we would like to. However, there are also uh, several cost effective ways of studying the third Greece. And we can do that, for example, also by moving away from what archaeologists call typological analysis. So just types and move at study, move towards studying the actual production of artifacts. We can quantify artifacts by using databases and software. And this is something I will uh, explain and show in the case study I have brought to you today. And we can also use ethnographic parallels and comparative analysis to look better at how pottery production, weaving, agriculture, uh, and other labor might have been conducted. So these are uh, very helpful when we want to start describing uh, realities about which we don't have so many written uh, sources. Now, uh, I will show you how this can function by looking at a case study, which I have been uh, studying for several years now, about which I have uh, published several works, uh, which is a very interesting, uh, interesting place. So it's the island, uh, which was in ancient times called Pitekusai. In modern times, it's uh, Ischia. It's a very popular holiday spot. So, and if we hopefully return to international travel, I can very much recommend it as a place to visit because it's absolutely uh, beautiful, a wonderful island in the Bay of Naples. Now, Pitagosa is also considered to have been the very first overseas foundation uh, colony, uh, however you would like to call it. Peter Gossai is a space where I think one of the most famous cups from antiquity comes from. It's the Nestor cup, which is uh, one of the earliest inscriptions we have from the Greek world. So it dates to the late 8th century and the inscription is damaged. Um, there are several reconstructions. I have brought this one to you tonight uh, and that reads, I am Nestor's cup good to drink from. Whoever drinks this cup empty straight away, desire for beautiful crowned Aphrodite will seize him. So we see here a wonderful um, um, reference to uh, the symposium, to drinking, to the merrymaking, uh, to wine and to love and so on. So it's a, it's a very famous uh, and absolutely delightful testimony we have from Peter Kursai. Now, about Peter Kusa, we don't know anything from Greek sources, from ancient Greek sources. So our first references are actually from uh, around the first century, late first century uh, BCE. So we have a reference in Strabo uh, who wrote a, a geography, a description of, uh, of the known world, uh, specifically uh, Italy. And he is talking uh, at a certain point about Pitekusai, 
which according to him was peopled by a colony of Eretrians and Chalcidians, uh, and which was very prosperous on account of the fertility of the soil and the productive gold mines. So also here we get a reference to where uh, the founders supposedly came from. Now, in Livy, we have some more information. Livy is actually talking about a city called Kuma, which was on the mainland right opposite of uh, Peter Kusai. And he has actually some information about this uh, because he says that the Kumani derived their origin from Chalkis in Euboea. And thanks to the fleet in which they sailed from their home, they enjoyed much power on the coast of that sea by which they dwell. Having landed first on the island of Igneria and the Pitekusai, and they afterwards ventured to transfer their sea to the mainland. So here we learn that first the Greeks came to these islands and then uh, settled in a new city on the mainland. Now, um, this image actually depicts the foundation of Kuma. So it was um, produced in Naples, 19th century, uh, an uh, artistic imagination of how uh, the foundation of a city would have happened. And I think it is a wonderful picture because it shows uh, everything that is wrong with the traditional assumption about Greek colonization. So we see the two founders of Kuma, who, according to ancient sources, were called uh, Megasthenes, who came from Chalkis, and a Hippocles of Kuma. We don't know on the picture who's who, but what we see is that the one is dressed as a philosopher, it's a wise man with a beard, and the other one is dressed uh, in, in armor. He's uh, the new Pericles, he's ready to defend uh, the homeland, and uh, effectively, uh, he's followed, both are followed by the settlers, by the colonists who are armed uh, and ready to conquer uh, their new home. Now, in the front, we see a woman, a uh, scarcely clad woman who represents the indigenous population and she just feigns uh, by seeing the almighty Greeks, by seeing the Greek civilization arriving in Italy and ready to, um, to conquer and to shine and to civilize uh, the world. Now, uh, luckily nowadays we are moving away from that and we start asking different kind of questions. Now, one of these questions that we can ask is by looking at the material culture. So not just the images in the written text, but what was actually found on the ground. Now, Peter Kosai has been uh, subject to one of these big dig projects. So they have mainly dug up a necropolis, as you can see on the slide, um, about which I will tell some more later on. Um, they've also found a small metalworking quarter. And then um, here under the cross uh, was actually not excavated by archaeologists, but the local priest thought it would be a nice project to duck up uh, the floor under his church. And he discovered several tombs and a pottery uh, quarter, so a pottery workshop. Um, now, luckily, he kept some kind of record of his excavations, and after a lot of painstaking work, an archaeologist was recently able to save a lot of the material and actually uh, publish it. I will also come back to that later. Now, the necropolis in Peter Kusai uh, is exceptional. Uh, it's exceptional because it was a big dig and we have a lot of tombs. We have hundreds and hundreds of tombs. We have the content of the tombs. So you see depicted some of the um, types of uh, vases, uh, material that was found inside the tombs. Uh, but another important thing about this necropolis is what archaeologists call stratigraphy. Now, stratigraphy uh, basically means the layers one on top of the, of the other. Now, uh, unique in the necropolis of Peter Kusai is that the tombs, so inhumation tombs, cremation tombs, 
were built one on top of the other. So it's basically like an onion. Uh, you can peel back the layers and in the middle you have the oldest tombs. And this is, of course, extremely helpful for archaeologists if we want to describe the kind of development and cultural change uh, and daily life progressing through the material remains we find. Now, these are some of the uh, some of the context, some of the contents of the tombs. So not all tombs, but many tombs uh, contain uh, one or two vases, in some cases, many vases. So these were, um, as you can uh, see here on the slide, on the lower row, these are uh, called arribaloi. These were um, bottles that contained perfumed oil. And in the back, you see larger containers. They are lekitoi, uh, and they also contained oil, uh, probably perfumed, uh, might have been used in funerary rites. Now, on the bottom, we see some more materials. So these are um, uh, small pieces that were used uh, to prepare the wool for the weaving. And we see some bronze um, bracelets. Now, on the other slide, we also see some bronze uh, a ring, a finger ring, and feebly that were used to uh, keep uh, the garments together, uh, the clothing together. And here we also see a skifos, uh, a cup used for drinking wine, and also an oinochoe, uh, a jug used for uh, pouring wine. So this is the kind of material we are dealing with here in a necropolis. Um, it's not all very well preserved because actually Pitukusai is a volcanic island and the soil was very hot uh, and the excavators uh, report that they were working with uh, uh, ground with, with the earth that was up to 60 degrees warm. That is, is really hot and of of course, the temperature has destroyed uh, many of the many of the vessels and also the paint that was on top of it. So the archaeologists have really done an exceptional job in uh, piecing all these parts together and publishing them. Now. As soon as the first excavations uh, delivered some results, a huge debate erupted about exactly this topic of identity. Why? Because, well, if we would believe the written sources, we would think we were dealing with a settlement of Greeks that came from Euboea. However, if we look at the material culture, okay, we see the Nestor cup, uh, which is not from Euboea, uh, but from uh, Rhodes probably. And um, here in the bottom, we have a Corinthian um, cup, uh, uh, which is also not uh, from the mother city. And in addition, we have a lot of material, like here, this beautiful figurative uh, oil container that uh, comes from the Near East. We have a cup. This comes from the indigenous parts of Italy from around Rome, uh, from the region of Lazio, and a small wine drinking cup. And this is a vase that comes from, well, actually the region of uh, Apulia and the Ionian coast of Italy. So there's a huge diversity in the material culture. And this is only confirmed in uh, other material from the tombs, like uh, the Feebly actually have no parallels in the Greek world. They have parallels in the indigenous world. There's a lot of scarabs and seals that uh, are related to types that come from uh, the East, from Egypt. Uh, or might have been an imitation produced on roads. So that somehow confuses our picture. And archaeologists have been debating this uh, problem, like who were the Pitagusans, for decades. Now, going back to the new methods that we are seeking now to apply to understand these big digs from the past better, I embarked many years ago on a project in which I simply decided to quantify the material. So this is a, I wouldn't say um, 
time effective it's extremely time consuming but a cost effective solution because basically the only thing you need is a laptop and i watched a lot of youtube videos to learn how i could make a simple database and i uh, made one and i managed to quantify to put all this information from the tombs into a database to see how it would line up because we are dealing here with hundreds of tombs and thousands of objects. And there's simply no human mind that can work around this. So what archeologists have been doing for a very long time is having discussions about the beautiful pots and about the beautiful jewelry without actually looking at the patterns uh, that are actually there. Uh, what image do we get if we put all the information together? So uh, the software I decided to use is uh, called Network Analysis, and it's basically very similar to uh, what we know from, uh, for example, Facebook, so social network. So rather than making a network from uh, friends, as we, we would do on Facebook and see how they related, uh, I decided to make a network of the material culture in Peter Kusai and see how that helped us understand the situation. So I was able to uh, exploit this idea of stratigraphy, so the chronological evolution of the tombs. And what I discovered by simply looking at the quantities of material culture is that actually in the earliest levels, we find more of the native uh, population, material culture of the native population. And it was only after several generations that Greek material culture, and then specifically from Corinth, became more important in quantitative terms. Now, there's a difference between actual material culture and the kind of social identities that people might have maintained, but it indicates uh, that there is some kind of dimension in the material culture that we were not quite grasping. So, I myself, uh, but also other people have started looking in more detail at what might have been happening in daily life. Now, um, specifically here, pottery production is very informative um, because we know a lot about uh, um, the production. We have this pottery workshop. We also know about the consumption, so the hundreds of contexts in which this pottery was used. Now, in terms of pottery, we definitely see innovations from the very beginning. We see Greek pottery uh, being important, being imitated, so beautiful painted pots uh, with an affiliation to the Greek world. We also see, until the very end, a continuity in the presence of native uh, pots, and these are the ugly pots that have been very often ignored by archaeologists. So the cores where the cooking pots, the storage vessels, and the basically uh, the daily pots and pans that people would use to eat uh, and prepare food. Now, um, as I said, there was this priest who dug up uh, this uh, pottery production place and um, Gloria Alcese, an Italian archaeologist, has produced this beautiful book, beautiful reconstructions, a very detailed study of the material. Uh, and one of the earliest ovens that you here see in the circle uh, on the slide um, dates from exactly uh, this period of use of the necropolis. And in the study, uh, Gloria Alcese could also find which uh, types of pots might have been made in the oven. And you see here uh, one depicted on the slide. Basically, what she found, she also um, managed to study through microscopic analysis, origin and production uh, of the pots. And what she found, interestingly, is that in one oven, there was both indigenous types of pottery and Greek types of pottery produced. So we are dealing here with a very mixed context and it's impossible to separate and say, this was the oven for the Greek potter, this was the oven for the native uh, potter. It's a very mixed 
reality. Uh, so that's very interesting, of course. Now, uh, in the oven on Pietikusai, uh, we see that most of the vessels that were found in a necropolis uh, might have been produced sort of small drinking vessels, the Oinochoe, the cooking pots, and so on. However, Pietikusai must have been important for another type of production, and that is wine. So even today, Pitekusai or Ischia is um, very suitable for wine. It's a volcanic island, which is absolutely excellent uh, to cultivate wine. And we even have some traces of um, uh, production uh, basins that might be medieval, uh, perhaps date from antiquity. They have not been uh, studied extensively uh, yet, but uh, it's one of the indications that wine continued to have an important role on the island. Now, the reason we know that wine was important already in the early days of the so-called colony uh, is that um, there are a lot of amphorae, uh, amphorae that are thought to have contained the wine that was produced on the island. Now, um, I have a forthcoming study about the amphorae. Uh, there's actually a lot of problems with the amphorae uh, because the archaeologists think there are two main types of amphorae. I have looked at the material. I think there are at least uh, 10 plus different types of amphorae. I'm not going to keep you here for another half hour to look at amphorae types. I'm just going to summarize some of the conclusions uh, from my study about the amphorae and the kind of society we might be dealing with on uh, Pitekusai. So I've also looked at uh, the tombs in which we find these amphorae. And what I discovered in my analysis, you see one extract on the slide, is that tombs that had amphorae were also the tombs that had the uh, nice Greek drinking vessels, that had the nice Greek perfume bottles, uh, had the nice oriental perfume bottles, whereas actually a large part of the tombs, so you see the tombs here represented as dots, um, uh, so basically, as it would be on a, on a Facebook reconstruction, the dots here, uh, these are tombs that do not have these wine drinking materials. So this is some kind of indicative that there is some kind of segregation between people who had access to wine, who at least had the material uh, remains, had the wealth to deposit this kind of paraphernalia for drinking wine into their tombs, whereas another part of the population did not. Uh, which in itself already contradicts this kind of idea that uh, in a site designated a Greek colony, everyone would be drinking wine, which does not seem to have been the case, at least based on the deposition of the material in the tombs. So to give us an idea about, let's say, the social class that had access to this wine, that participated in this culture, we can uh, look at this wonderful quote from Homer, who describes Odysseus' storage room. And it is described as high roofed, a wide room where gold and bronze lay piled and raiment in chests and stores of fragrant, or fragrant oil. And there too stood great jars of wine, old and sweet, holding within them an unmixed divine drink and ranged in order along the wall. Now, actually we have even uh, some um, archaeological remains that show us how such a storage room or a storage space might have looked like. And on the left hand, you see a reconstruction from a place uh, called uh, Zagora, an island uh, where uh, the archaeological excavations have shown that in the house, the amphorae would have occupied a very visible place to show the owner's wealth, to, to show agricultural um, um, prosperity, to show the kind of abundance that one would like to have. 
On the right hand side, we have an excavation uh, image from an excavation from Peter Kusai itself, from a rural uh, house, a settlement in which exactly the same kind of setup was documented, one in which the amphorae and the storage vessels would occupy a very visible place within the room. So basically, uh, this brings us back to our question, like what kind of people are we talking about? Which Greeks are we, uh, are we dealing with? Uh, so as uh, hopefully you could uh, gather from, uh, from my discussion is that there's a very high level of cultural mixture, uh, which indicates that we are dealing with a multicultural context rather than the Eubian foundation mentioned in the sources. And it's a, a situation I think that's not very different from our globalized world today, in which being cosmopolitan meant knowing about the exotic food and drink, uh, meant mobility of people and ideas, and all of this resulted in the cultural wealth that today we describe with this one word, Greek. Now, scholars nowadays are thinking that it might be more appropriate to use the Greek word Greek network rather than Greek culture, uh, because it would help us uh, to include the so-called periphery, this so-called third Greece, better into this core of classical sculptures, uh, culture that scholars have so long preferred. And I would say uh, even abuse this classical culture to legitimize modern colonialism and imperialism. However, our understanding of the Greek world is only as good as the concepts we use. And uh, to continue on this uh, philosophical note, let's go back to Plato at uh, the very start of our lecture. So Plato in his quote was not exactly giving a geographical description of the ancient world of the Greek world. He is actually discussing the immortality of the soul and he advocates the existence of a world of which we only see the shadows. Now in Plato's days, we would continue philosophizing about all of this and we would have our own uh, symposium, we would raise our cups, we would drink with Nestor, and I very much hope you have done so already virtually, and I will definitely do so tonight to all of your health. Thank you very much for being here with me. Um, thank you, Livy, for that um, fascinating, interesting sort of um, presentation. And there are um, a few questions um, from the floor through our chat, but I might um, kickstart the questioning. Um, those Greek colonists that um, arrived in Sicily and, and founded quite a few colonies, when they arrived there, um, the local inhabitants, um, what language or languages did they speak? And how do we know that when I assume there was probably no written alphabet? Uh, well, that's that's a very good question and a very difficult one, uh, because indeed we don't have uh, any written testimonies, at least from the early period. So we are bound to go on much later descriptions. Uh, so basically we have to work with Thucydides, who says, oh, there's these tribes and these tribes and these tribes. In archaeological terms, we do not find traces of the tribes that Thucydides refers to. So there's a lot of discussion among scholars like what it meant. Was it a linguistic distinction that he's talking about? Uh, is it cultural? Uh, because we don't see it in the material culture. What we do have from later periods is some very short inscriptions uh, in native languages that uses uh, the Greek alphabet. So we do have some idea about non-Greek languages being spoken in these parts, but what exactly they were, we don't know, and we probably will never know. Okay, okay. okay. Um, we'll go to the questions in the chat. The first one is from um, Ioni Ioannidis. Um, given that modern hypothesis that pre-industrial populations were relatively stable, how do we explain the constant stream of colonists over 300 years? 
And also, what are we at to understand by the word colonists in terms of group size and composition? Uh, that's another uh, absolutely excellent question, and it's uh, one that's uh, very much up to debate. Um, now, some scholars have tried to calculate the amount of people that could potentially have been sent out uh, because we have some descriptions. So Herodotus at a certain point refers to an expedition in which every second son of a city was sent out. Um, in reality, probably groups must have been small. I mean, if we think about these eighth or seventh century uh, polis, they were not very large. They had a population of a couple of thousands. You could not send half of the people away because the city at home would simply not survive, uh, which leads to the next step in the interpretation. Um, were there really very large groups moving overseas? Um, if we go uh, on the archaeological evidence we have, like the reality in Peter Kusai, which is one we actually see also reflected in other places, um, the mobility must have been, I mean, the mobility was there, no doubt, uh, but probably smaller groups, individuals moving, um, perhaps also people moving for a couple of years, then moving on. Um, or people, um, let's say, trading. Like, for example, nowadays we are used to moving very fast, but in ancient times you would only have a certain short season in which you could sail, which meant that if you were traveling or trying to trade or reach someone or visit someone, you were gone for several years. And you might have been forced to spend, for example, an entire winter somewhere waiting to be able to move on or to move back. So these are different, let's say, dimensions to mobility that are very often not taken into account in our discussion. Um, uh, when discussing Greek colonization. So people could have moved in much more flexible ways uh, than uh, the one, let's say, the idea that is generated by this notion of colonist uh, establishing himself in a place and never, never ever leaving again. Um, question here from John Katsoulis. Once this other Greece or third Greece was established, is there evidence of a divergent cultural development from the various things around Greece, Italy and elsewhere? Yeah, uh, actually, well, yes, um, I wouldn't say that the third Greece was really established is more a philosophical idea idea of uh, everything that's outside Athens and uh, Athens and Sparta. But yes, actually, the more we look at the material culture, the more we realize that there was no such thing as Greek culture that was the same everywhere. So there was a lot of regional variations um, in, in the kind of behaviors, in the gods, uh, even in the language, in the pots, in the temples, in the houses, in the paintings they, um, they might have put up uh, on the wall. So we call all of that Greek, but in reality, it's, uh, it's very different. Hence the idea that we might say better like a Greek network rather than just a static idea of Greek culture. Uh, thank you for that. I've got a question here from Professor Parkin. Um, is what you learn from Pithecusi applicable to the whole Mediterranean world, or is it many ways unique? Does your work answer the bigger questions you raise, or is it providing part of a range of possibilities? Well, that's a really excellent question. Um, it is uh, somehow uh, indicative uh, of what is going on, the kind of uh, dimension, the presence of native culture that is popping up everywhere. Um, in the end, every situation was, of course, uh, of course, unique um, in the sense that, uh, well, local dynamics are, are always there. However, I think as far as I have been studying the Greek overseas settlements, uh, there is not a single one where it, there is no such a thing as the ind indigenous dimension in the earlier layers. So we are definitely looking at more flexible ways of uh, moving, of interaction, of uh, city, uh, let's say, transformation uh, rather than establishment by Greeks. Um. Got a question here from Vicky Labropoulou. Uh, very interesting, this material network approach. Is it widespread? Is it implemented in other universities too? Or is it something new and emerging? 
Well, uh, that's also a very good question. It is, I would say, emergent uh, in the sense we've been using it, uh, not just me, it's a quite lively uh, community that is using this kind of approach. I think I would say for um, renewed for around 10 years uh, or so. But actually, archaeologists have been experimenting with these kind of methods for several decades now. Now, and if the topic really interests you, I have written an introduction to uh, network analysis in archaeology. So I have a profile page on academia and uh, the introduction to my book that has just appeared, The Archaeological Networks and Social Interaction, actually gives you this whole background rounds of information. So if you like, you can download the chapter for free and uh, you can read all about that. Okay. Um, time just for a few more questions. Uh, we won't keep you till midnight. And uh, so No, no, that's a, well, it's your midnight. For me, it's uh, midday. <laughs> I have time. <laughs> I'm very okay. pleased to have uh, questions. Um, given no Greek sources mentioned Pythacusia as a Greek colony, is it surprising that we don't see a purely Greek city? Roman sources traced almost every Roman city's heritage back to Greece or Troy. First Roman king, kings were Corinthians, for example. Yeah, uh, that is also a very good uh, question. Actually, it should not surprise us, but it has to do with the origin of our discipline, uh, very simply. Archaeologists uh, used ancient sources uh, primarily to establish where they would go and dig. And they used to, uh, let's say, interpret all of their discoveries within this literary framework. And of course, as a result, archaeologists were very surprised, not just in Peter Kusai, but also in the other colonies to see like, oh, our material culture does not really reflect uh, the mother city. Um, so now we have come to the point that we uh, some sort of let go of the written sources and try to look at them in their own right, what they were trying to say in their own day, rather than think that this is an accurate history of the centuries before they were actually written. Um, this is another question from John Katsoulis. Um Once um, speakers of a language leave the metropolitan centre, with time, it's quite possible that the language sort of develops evolves in its own development sort of pathway. So what differences in the Greek language are parents over the Greek network with time? Yeah, that's a, a very good question. And I would say a very complicated one. So I'm not a linguist. Uh, there are people actually studying this, uh, this specific question on its own. Um, Actually, there was no such thing as a fixed Greek language. So Greek language transformed all of the time and through interaction, similarities would be, uh, would be maintained. Um, and it's one of the discussion points that has been, uh, has been very relevant for the Greek colonization debate because it was also thought that within the traditional framework, these colonists would bring their dialect with them. And then in several cases, we also find that the so-called colony does not reflect a dialect that was spoken in the mother city. So this again indicates that there was much more flexibility uh, in the language actually spoken uh, in throughout uh, the ancient Greek world. Well, I think very much like today, people bring their own dialects, acquire new languages, uh, perhaps even and change dialects if they live for long enough in the same place. Okay, I think that brings an end to our bringing an end to our question time. Um, Leave. Um, thank you very much. Once you come to Melbourne, we do owe you that glass of wine. So um, more than welcome <laughs> and see the Greek Centre and the work that's been done there. And um, best of luck on your return and um, the startup of your new position very soon in the near future. So, yeah. Well, okay. thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks again for the many questions and uh, the invitation to speak, uh, to speak to you tonight. I'm very much looking forward to uh, being there and being with you at the uh, Greek Centre at a future opportunity. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.